This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama with uh, a guest on a show called All About Leadership. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and we're going to explore today what it takes, what it really takes to run and manage complex operations in the Asia Pacific region with a guest whom I have known since we were neighbors in the Hiro area of Tokyo. And this is a topic that many young people in Hawaii, ever since I did the first All About Leadership show, has been asking me, how can we prepare ourselves? So how, how can we get insights and advice to really do complex operations and management in the Asia Pacific region? And, and to my left is Alvin Miyasato. And where were you born and raised? Well, you know, Ray, um, first I want to thank you for inviting me here. Um, this is a favorite topic of mine. Okay. Uh, I was born in um, actually Honolulu. Right. I grew up primarily in Kaneohe, the Windward right. side. Uh, went to you know the public school system, right. Castle High School, and then from there went to the University of Hawaii. And what did you study there at University of Hawaii? Well, it's kind of an interesting story for myself. Yeah. Um, I actually started up in engineering. My father was an engineer, oh. and I actually was quite good in math and right. science. So my sophomore year, uh, the professor said, hey, one of the special projects for all of you uh, coming in engineering is take an egg, put it in an egg, uh, build some kind of container, we're going to drive it on the fifth floor and see if it cracks. And I at that point said, this doesn't sound as interesting to me as what they're doing in the College of Business, <laughs> which is you know, starting uh, different kind of businesses, right, doing, right. You know, selling products. So uh, that day, actually, I then changed to the College of Business, and I, be, I studied uh, accounting. Oh, okay, yeah. all right. And when you studied accounting, what did you think you were going to do in the future? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Uh, I thought I would, you know, stay in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, you know, become a CPA. Right. You know, there are large established CPA firms right. here. People rose to the ranks. You could do pretty well. There's a lot of opportunities to, you know, see different kinds of uh, businesses. Uh, that's what I thought I'd be doing, um, and kind of progress in that way. And I think like a lot of my peers at that time, we were all ambitious and trying to you know, really excel, trying to make something bigger for what we were doing in Hawaii. And, you know, showing off the University of Hawaii that it was great top talent too. And, and so you did work in Honolulu for a couple of years. Yeah, I, uh, I had a chance to interview with a number of companies. I actually ended up with Price Waterhouse. Right. Uh, I was very impressed with the clientele. Because you know, basically, you kind of learn through the experiences you go through. And, uh, much to my learning was they actually had the largest retail in Hawaii, which nobody knew at that time, wow. which was duty-free yeah, shops. Right, right, right. Um, that, yeah. You know, great learning. And they also had a pretty good you know, national program of training right. and development. So I was doing that for two years. Um, after that, I realized uh, accounting is interesting in the sense of you get to see a lot of businesses, but you tend to look at historical information. Okay, right. And as someone then later told me, says, you know, you can decide if you want to play ball or keep score. Okay. <laughs> and I said, gee, this uh, keeping score is interesting. Yeah. I think uh, playing ball would be interesting too. So then I decided I wanted to go away for school. Right. And uh, one of my um, managers there uh, um, decided uh, to take me under his wing and he actually went to Wharton. So he encouraged me to go apply. Uh, I did apply to Wharton. Um, I got some recommendations from some of the people at the University of Hawaii as well, and I ended up going to Wharton. And the, so you took your MBA there at the Wharton School, yes. and then it's part of the University of Pennsylvania, am yes. I correct? In, in yes. Philadelphia, exactly. which is quite cold today. Yes. And so uh, was there something unique that you gained at Wharton that uh, made you aware of, uh, of global enterprise? Yeah, I would say there was two things. First, um, by chance, I happened to join the Asia Club. Oh. And, and I said by chance because, you know, we were right. getting together and right. someone said, let's go. And so I went. And it was interesting to see the students from all the other Asia countries. A lot, some of them were coming from, you know, the um, wealthy family, you know, generation right, passing. Right. Some were just, uh, like myself, kind of going on. Right. But seeing the people there and listening to them of their opportunities they're having, what challenges are you going? Because at that point, when you're there in the 80s, this is mid 80s, you know, Japan was growing. Right. Uh, other countries were kind of seeing Japan as a role model. Korea is kind of coming up as well. Taiwan is kind of coming up. But you, you see all these different perspectives and how they were trying to work that through. And for me, that was a very intriguing opportunity. And, and the second one? 
Uh, well, you know, as I started working through that, the second one was, uh, you know, getting good professors. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I remember uh, one of my first semesters, I took a class in marketing, which, you know, my major was in finance. Right. I was very much a numbers kind of person. Right. Uh, but this professor came from Harvard. Uh, his name was David Rinstein. And he used a Socratic method. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'd really kind of pull us to think right. about things right. in a more holistic manner right. as opposed to just the functional. But then he also had us think about... You know, really think about what does the customer want, right? Which you know, oh, very common yeah, sense, right, right. but doesn't get practiced. Well. Right. But yeah. And, and then, uh, how did you get into your role at Intel Corporation? Uh, so after I uh, graduated from Wharton, uh, I had a chance to work at different places. I actually was here in Hawaii uh, for my internship at Pacific Resources. At oh, PRI, PRI. Of, of that period, yeah. yeah. And uh, when I graduated, I ended up working for Standard Oil of Indiana. Right. Uh, right. You know, very large company. Right. You learn a lot of good skills. Yeah. It was tremendous in the sense of you get good analytical training. Right. You see, in my case, I was the analyst uh, looking at the Middle East. I was doing oh, Egypt. Right. Yes. And so you see a lot of what was going right. on for government negotiations. And where were you based? Well, you I was, was in Chicago. Oh, Chicago, right. Yeah, so I went from one cold city to a more cold <laughs> okay. city, which was uh, more... Uh, but you were in the energy field. I was in the yeah, energy field. Right. Um, doing that, you know, what was the positive center of it was you learn quite a bit. I mean, they have a very rigorous method right. of how they look at uh, situations. They teach and groom you quite well. There's a very clear structured ladder. Uh, but for myself, uh, I thought about this and I said, you know, I, I have a very different culture myself. Mm. Um, I was much more, uh, I think, uh, informal. Right. And at that time, I started to read about these odd companies in some place called Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> where basically, right. you know, they dress not in suits right, and ties right. with kind of regular clothes. Yeah. You know, uh, they get to express their opinions right. as opposed to just waiting. And so there was an ad in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Uh, I applied for it. Right. Uh, I remember going in for the interview. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great story. I sat down and then this lady came in. I thought, oh, I'm going to get coffee. Yeah. She started asking me very hard questions. Yeah. Um, throughout the day, I met three or four people. And this was in uh, where? This, this in, in, in California? In, in, Arizona. In, in, in Arizona. In Arizona. Okay. All right. And uh, each of these persons were in finance. Right. They were looking for a financial analyst right. uh, for one of their businesses. It's a senior finance right. analyst. Uh, and what impressed me was, one, they were very informal, right. but very astute. Okay. And they're very committed to what they All were right. doing. And they were very rigorous, in, very rigorous in trying to find out that you knew what you well, you're yes. supposed to know. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Okay. And, and, you know, it was interesting because at that time, Intel at that time was about a billion dollar company. Okay, not that large. Uh, very, very, very small. Very at that. small. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, at that time, though, uh, people were aware of the PC and CPUs and, and a person named Andrew Grove, <laughs> who yeah. was an immigrant uh, to the, uh, the United States. And, and, and uh, that whole story was not really well known. Mm -hmm. What did you know about the semiconductor business uh, uh, before you entered Intel? Uh, I actually knew very little yeah. um, at coming into Intel. Uh, I had some understanding of the company itself, right. but what I was fortunate enough that when I joined this uh, business, it was Systems Interconnect business, the focus was on getting some large deals. Okay, right. And so at that time, Intel was about a billion dollar right. company, and actually, uh, I quickly in the first few months got put on a deal that if we had won it, it was an IBM deal. Hmm to build the actual PCs for IBM. Right, right. It would have been over $500 million. Wow. <laughs> that would have been a, 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 a substantial enlargement of the company. Yeah, so there was a lot of focus. But what really impressed me on that was the amount of delegation and trust hmm. uh, leadership showed. I mean, it was only, you, you, you know, they'd have you do the analysis. They'd have you give recommendations. But they really want you to own working moving forward with the team to go negotiate the deal. And so it worked out pretty well at the end. We actually decided not to take the deal because we thought if we actually won IBM, other OEMs may not take our processors. Oh, right, so right, it's a very right. interesting strategic right, discussion right. that we got into that says, you know, we can actually win this deal, right. but it's just going to be good for our long term. Right. You have to be agnostic, as yeah, we exactly. say. Yeah, and yeah. you can sell to many, many uh, companies. And that's one thing that Grohl brought into the discussion. Mm -hmm. right? He said, you know, we got to think about this, of, are we short term or long term, and what are the trade offs? And the other side was, the, after the first year I was there, we, that's when we exited memory. Hmm. So there was a huge uh, hole in the line uh, as well from that. But he said, we're going to make a bet. Microprocessors looks like it could have opportunity. And he focused the company on that. So
so what, in hindsight, that's called making a bet the company bet, <laughs> uh, that you would get out of what would become a commodity business, yes. uh, the memory chip business. I was in the semiconductor business with analog devices. But that, that was going to uh, be not the way of the future to be, gain a high margin business. Right. And the CPU was it. Right. And tell me, uh, can you define for the audience, what is a CPU? Yeah, basically a CPU, a central processing unit, is kind of like the brains of the computer. It does a lot of the processing, analytics. It helps to really ensure that problems can get solved, you know, mathematically right. do. So it really is a central part of how you kind of look and compute for the industry. Now, in the beginning, the CPU was in laptops and PCs. Right. Now they're in uh, uh, all kinds of uh, tablets and, uh, of course, uh, mobile devices, exactly. too. So they're much, the market has exponentially enlarged since that time. Yeah, this was something that, so Gordon Moore was one of the founders oh, right, of right. Intel. And he quoted, uh, he had this uh, axiom. The Moore's Law. The yes, Moore's yes, Law, I remember which is that. actually an economic law, oh. which is at the cost of computing, right would basically fall uh, in half every <laughs> couple of years, as you said, every 18 months. Right. And, you know, sure enough, we were actually going on that path. Wow. So that's why today, you know, what would have cost, like, a supercomputer back when I started right. is basically in a smartphone today. And, and it cost $60. Yeah, it really is. I mean, yeah, exactly. Right. The ASP's on this. Right. And it's continuing on. Um, now, can now, now, that Moore's Law, uh, unfortunately, did not translate to areas like the automobile. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed at But if we, uh, that uh, was, uh, uh, of course, in the automobile industry, right. we would get, you know, a billion miles to a gallon. Exactly. Uh, and, and the car would cost, you know, $100. Yeah. But that didn't happen. <laughs> you know, you're right. And uh, we don't see that. Unfortunately, Gordon Moore didn't go to the automobile industry to stay there. <laughs> but what's interesting is, you know how the mature industries right yeah. now are using data? Right. Like even automobiles are becoming much more data intensive. Right. Um, so you, you kind of see this where, as you said, the cost of computing has gone down so significantly. Right that a lot of other industries are using this to basically drive competitive advantage and, you know, good experiences for all of us. Now, you talk about two uh, people, Gordon Moore and Andrew Grove. Right. Uh, what are the impacts on Intel? Different impacts and into the world? What, what yeah. are the influences? Uh, I think there's there's two, at least, I can remember. So there, there's another founder named uh, Bob Noyce. Right, right. Noyce, yes, yes, yes. He was yeah. very good about... Oh, the Fairchild Semiconductor. Fairchild, yeah. yeah, yeah. And he was one of the more, he was one of the clear leaders. But he had a point about don't be encumbered by the past. Hmm. You know, do something great and look in the future. Right. Gordon was more the strategic visionary. He'd say, mm. you, we should think forward. And then Grove, at that point, when he first came on, he was very much the execution guy. He right. helped us create everything through. Uh, I think what Intel really helped was driving the idea of Moore's Law into practical mm. volume. Because if you couldn't really manufacture huge volumes, then you wouldn't see the industry evolve the way it has. And, and was there impact, of course, from uh, universities like MIT, Stanford, and others? Uh, what influence did that have on the development of products at Intel? I, I think it's really important that uh, when you first think about compute, you know, people didn't understand or didn't appreciate how pervasive this could be. Mm. I think Andy Grove for a long time thought, well, you know, this market process, this is something that businesses would use. <laughs> uh, consumers really see that? Right. Maybe not. But this is where you know the school started to have different usage models. They took it to the students. The right. students who are very intel, you know, very capable, started to develop different kind of programs right. for the whole engineering, scientific, and education. Right. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. yeah. And that's how you had like um, Excel come out. Right. Actually, you know, I think it was Visicalc. Right. It came out from I think in Boston. Uh, Lotus One Two Three. Lotus yeah. 1, 2, 3, right. Yeah. And so, you know, it was those kind of models that allow people to say, hey, there's some consumer opportunities here in addition to business, that now we see it's, you know, very much consumer driven that drives all this. That's, and so, um, how did it become a global business? Uh, how did, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley and Arizona and some other spots in the U.S. go out and, and uh, establish plants all over the world? What, what was the drivers for that? Yeah, at Intel, uh, one of the things that we started to realize, and this is clearly uh, something that was realized by the founders and the senior manager, you know, at that time I was just a finance manager, was there was tremendous opportunity internationally. And we're going to hold that okay. point and we're going to go, come back to the expansion in Asia Pacific after this break. Right. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation Every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. 
Aloha. Oh, hi guys. It's RB Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool. And I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm RB Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. We are back on All About Leadership on Think Tech Hawaii on this lovely afternoon with my friend Al Miyasato. And we're just about talking about internationalization uh, in the high-tech industry called semiconductors. Go ahead. So at the time, uh, you know, Intel at that point, this would be about the late 80s, early 90s, saw that Japan had tremendous technology mm -hmm. innovation going on. You know, these companies are looking through there. So there was a big push to see how we could leverage that technology mm -hmm. in for Intel. Um, the other side of what Asia offered was very low cost, manufacturing and you know, R&D development right. help. So we actually established uh, the first plant. I think our first international plant ever was in Malaysia. Oh, Malaysia, right. Malaysia. Right. The other thing that we started to realize was, while well, China was a, a little bit closed, the opportunity, given the population, right. was huge. And Intel had done, based on the US work, was that as economies moved to middle income, we actually had analytics that computing uh, purchasing increased. And so when you kind of looked at the China market, you saw a tremendous potential. So getting into China was very important. So working on how we entered that was very important as well. So um, right now, you're the former head of Asia, Asia Region for Finance Leadership Development uh, for Intel. Now, what was the job that took you to Japan, the first one? So uh, I was asked to come in to be the control of Japan. At that time, Japan was about, uh, about uh, 800 billion dollar, 800 million dollar enterprise. Uh, there was a lot of opportunity given the electronics and right. also the, yeah. just the natural Japanese interest in technology. Right. And so we were on this path uh, with the local management to focus on how we can grow that TAM uh, double in a few years. And so that's kind of what the assignment I had was as well as how we rationalize it. And, and did you want to go to Japan at that point? Had uh, you ever spoken Japanese? Did you say, I want to go because I, uh, uh, I want to go there to expand my knowledge? Uh, what got you there? It's a great question. So, uh, you know, I'm Japanese. I don't speak right, Japanese, right. but I have always had an interest to go there. Uh, I remember that the job opened up. I applied, and I thought, you know, given my background, I have oh, a great chance. Okay. Uh, I didn't get even an interview. They told me, we give the job to somebody else. Oh. And so my boss said, don't worry. He said, you know, just yeah. continue to do good work. Okay. Um, and actually, this was Andy Bryant, who was at that time to see uh, the division controller. Right. Two years later, uh, I get this call, and they said, hey, you know, we remember that you wanted to go to Japan. Right. Uh, if you want the job, the, con the senior CFO is here. You fly down tomorrow, and he was willing to hire you. <laughs> I flew down. <laughs> yeah. and within, so, you know, it's a very interesting story. Right. It's a story of, I think, if you want to have something, you should go yeah. after it okay. and let people know. Right, right, right. And, and so uh, how many years did you spend in Japan at that point? I spent two years in Japan at that point. Right. Uh, and we continued the work of you know, increasing the market. Right. And by the time I left, we had doubled the business. And then you came back to, the, to Arizona after uh, that. I went to Oregon. After Oregon, that. I'm yeah, sorry. I was yeah. uh, working on the supply chain uh, for some of the components. And then from there? From there, then uh, I got a call to say, hey, you know, the CFO of Intel Japan is retiring. Do you want to come back as the CFO? Because one of the things I've done at the last one was we were based in Scuba, and Tokyo was our center of action. Right. So we had made a proposal to move the headquarters to Tokyo. Right. And now this is kind of moving forward. Too. And Scuba is, uh, was, and still is, a center for all kinds of R&D, and yes. there's a great university there at Scuba University. And, and, and so uh, you spent another stint in Japan mm -hmm. uh, for Intel as a CFO. And, that you're, and as you're moving in your career, you're uh, getting larger and larger responsibility. Right. And, and then uh, from uh, Japan, where did you go? Uh, after Again. Japan, uh, I was asked to go back to the US. Um, but I had met um, my, my, my fiance and my wife. So I ended up um, taking a job in Asia again. Oh, right. And I went to Philippines because right. at that point they were expanding the footprint. Uh, Intel at that time, this was about the early 2000s now, um, was looking at Asia as being you know, a major growth center. And so they could see that as a percent of company revenue would double in hmm. about five to 10 years. 
So that means more manufacturing. And so we're looking at how we expand the manufacturing. Now, now would you say that uh, having the Intel operations um, plants uh, or more than one in, in the Philippines and hiring people, did that uh, uh, boost up the high tech uh, kind of uh, capabilities of the country? Uh, it definitely did. Actually, at that point, Intel was the largest exporter wow. in the country. And so you could see that that had a big impact. Plus, it was technology. And, you know, we bring in people, we train them on the technology. Because even, you know, running an assembly plant takes right. a lot of technical oh, yeah. expertise. So that was very important. Right. The other side, though, was um, teaching people, you know, management practices. Just basic right. management practices was important so that we could run the plant 24 by 7 to meet the demand. And so, you know, whatever it's setting expectations, how you inspire people, because the style of Intel is, you know, we need people to speak up so that you can get the best answer, as opposed to command style, which is basically right. do as I say. Right. This is much more of, hey, we need the best answer. Let's understand what it is. We have processes that we have to follow, of course, and we have uh, policy to make it happen. But if you have innovation, you've got to be able to listen. And that's one of the things about the leadership and we had. And then you were in China for how many years? Uh, well, I was in Hong Kong. You're right. Um, for, well, I've been, I've been in Hong Kong now for over 10 years. Right. My charter was regional. And so based on that, uh, I was there when we started up the Chengdu facility. Hmm. Um, that was part of uh, our plans where, you know, as you know, as you go look at opportunities, right. uh, a lot of companies will say, I'm going to start up a plan. Right. Uh, but the challenge for the opportunity is, can you drive a government agenda? That's <laughs> okay. part of the leadership right. challenge. Right. And you know, China was saying, we right. want to have more business in the right. West. So Chengdu started up. Uh, Darling was the same thing. Right. Let's move to the north. And Chengdu is where Mao Zedong is from. Yes. Uh, it, and it's not in the more urbanized area of China. I mean, this, this is quite a pioneer effort when right. you went out to Chengdu. Yeah, it, very much uh, like any leadership uh, challenges, you, know, you want to go out and set a new agenda. In our case, uh, Chengdu government was extremely smart in that they said, if we can get a large MNC here, we can attract other MNCs. And right. so we were the first ones to go there. Now, before we uh, go into even more depth, I want to ask the question that I think many young people in Hawaii would like to ask you. Based on all your experiences, Asia Pacific, working for a high-tech company, uh, Fortune 100 company like Intel, what advice would you give them in terms of preparing themselves a career in high technology or Asia Pacific? Or are there things you found in your background growing up in Hawaii that were of value that nobody really thought about? Yeah, I would say one of the things that I benefited from in Hawaii was the diversity of the cultures. Um, you know, we have so many people from so many different backgrounds here that it's very easy to start to get to know people and appreciate the different cultures and similarities as well. That actually helped me in my various jobs, because even in the US, we would be talking to people in Europe uh, mm -hmm. and Asia. When I went to Asia, it was interesting as you were trying to talk to someone in the Philippines, right. trying to see how you motivate them or drive change there, right. uh, as well as you know working with people in Malaysia. Right. But it was just something that I felt very comfortable with oh, good, because yeah. of the background I had. Right. I think the other aspect I would encourage young people to think about is um, you need to let people know what you want to go do in the future. And as Good simple point. as that sounds, yeah. uh, I have a number of people who I mentor, and they yeah. tell me their concern with that is if they tell their boss right. they want to have a job different than the current job, <laughs> right. the boss will not care about them as right. much. Yeah. But if you're not willing to take the risk, hmm. you know, people won't help you. Like hmm. The reason I got the job in Hong Kong was I told my boss, uh, I, need, I need to go back because of my, my right. wife. And I said, I may need to leave Intel. He right. said, don't make any hasty decisions. Something will happen. And sure enough, two weeks later, I got a call to go to Asia. Wow. Yeah. So it was very important. Right. Yeah. Now, you evolved into um, a financial leadership uh, development uh, within the company and the region, right. regional kind of thing. Uh, what did that entail? Uh, what kind of people were you uh, kind of uh, developing? And, and what kind yeah. of skill sets were you really focused on? So in Asia, as we looked at it, we had like a number of expats uh, from finance management. Expatriates who are you know, uh, living in Asia. Go exactly. ahead. Yeah. And at that time, what we required of the Asia talent was basically you know, compliance work, just basically recording transactions. It was clear that as Intel was going to grow, we needed more decision-capable support, more what we call business partnership, you know, right. being able to act right. as the business manager. That means having them move from, say, a narrow focus on uh, process right. to more kind of analytic. Right. It also meant them having a local focus to mm. more global regional mm. focus to understand how the different parts of right. play together, uh, as well as then having them have a network so mm. they can be able to go out and call off. Right. 
And that, that required some difference. Was it a network within the company or outside the company? Uh, both. Oh. But at that point, it was primarily in the company, so they could pick up the phone. Right. It, just like uh, I think a lot of things are done, is you've got to be able to pick up the phone yeah. and talk to them. Right, right. And that being able to talk quickly is important because when you've got you know, people a thousand miles away from headquarters, the headquarters will be able to trust that right. people oh, yeah. make the right decision. Make the, yeah. And so that takes a lot. So that confidence. How about the two words uh, that we hear more about diversity and inclusion? Ah. Yeah, so at Intel, we had this uh, philosophy, and I think it's true of a lot of companies, where inclusion is not just about race or um, religion. Right. It's about how do you get the best ideas oh. from all the people. And so, you know, we would spend a lot of time. In fact, one of the interesting discussions we had is, um, how about gender right. diversity, right? And uh, we were focused about how can we continue to improve on that. Right. Because actually in finance, we actually had over half the... Uh, gray, the managers were women. Right. And so we wanted to ensure that we could continue building the right. pipeline. But inclusion was very important so that you make people feel belonging. Right. So they then will express their ideas. Right. They feel confident that they could you know, drive change and they'll tell you about what they're comfortable with. If they don't feel that sense of comfort, that sense of they can trust, then you won't get that interaction, which is so important in you know, understanding what kind of business opportunities there are. Well, it seems that this uh, expressing ideas is a big area, uh, and uh, of course, it's drives innovation. Because yes. Where does the ideas come from? Is it always innate in people, or can you can you train people to develop and express ideas? Yeah, I think it's a combination. I think for some people, you know, I think as they grow up, uh, one of our colleagues in China had an interesting comment. He says, you know, you want us to express our ideas right. to challenge the status quo. Right. You understand that in China, if we channel the status quo, we may get persecuted. <laughs> right, right. And it was yeah. a very you know, enlightening yeah. kind of conversation. But you know, we, we were talking about that. We said, yes, you're right. We're looking for something different here. Right. And so we need to have a different approach of how we have these people come up and discuss it with us. So in our case, we, we put them together with people from different cultures. Right. And Truen said, you know, these people are very smart, they're very hmm. capable, and in that culture, they were able to express opinions and you know, come up with some good ideas. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, as we close, how about Hong Kong? You've been living there for a long time. You like it? Uh, I definitely like Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, it's a place that I can see us you know, staying there for oh. quite a while. And it's a place that has a lot of opportunity. Okay. It's central to Asia. So, well, thank you. Th thank you, Al, for all your insights. I think this is a great discussion <coughs> we've having. Uh, two public school graduates from Hawaii uh, in the high-tech area. And I think that we can really bring more young people into this industry yeah. and make uh, them succeed. And I think your insights gave them some really good things to think about. And I hope uh, this will drive even more discussion and um, make people succeed, young people succeed in the future. Thank you very much. This is leadership, uh, all about leadership on ThinkTech Hawaii.